Welcome to Northwest Profiles, a look at people, places, and events of interest in the inland Northwest. It was a magical time filled with daring adventure. The planes were primitive, my goodness. It was all flying with the seat of your pants. When heroes wore leather helmets, jawed per pants, and walked on wings. They were the equivalent of our sports stars, our rock stars, our movie stars today. When it was still possible to be really first at something. First across America. First across the Atlantic. After 41 hours in the air, Clyde Pangborn and Hugh Herndon have successfully flown across the Pacific nonstop. This is about a man all but forgotten by history. Daredevil, adventurer, pioneer, Clyde Upside Down Pangborn. He's probably the most underappreciated, least recognizable superstar aviator of the times. In 1931, Clyde Pangborn and Hugh Herndon did what no one had done before, fly nonstop across the Pacific, marking one of the great aviation milestones. Born in the late 1890s, Clyde Edward Pangborn grew up in Orofino in St. Mary's, Idaho. It seemed like from an early age, Pangborn loved heights, he loved adventure. He evidently saw an early aviator fly into St. Mary's and was just so taken by the idea of going up into the air that from that moment on he was determined to become a pilot. His chance came in 1918. He joined the aviation division of the Army Signal Corps. That's where Pang met his first true love, a Curtis JN4D Jenny, basically a flying birdcage. He knew her inside and out. He had to know engines. They had to be mechanics in those days. They had to do everything themselves. The type of flying he did was flying rickety old biplanes, engines that had a life expectancy of about 120 hours forced landings all the time. He had skills that were way out there at the edge of what people could do. After the service, Pang became one of an elite group of daredevil pilots known as barnstormers. He was a daredevil. He would fly down the main street of town upside down about 20 feet off the tops of the, uh, the buildings just to let his mom know he was in town. Country Hicks like we all were at that time, we're pretty excited to see somebody actually turning a plane over and flying it upside down, walking on wings and that kind of thing. That was really big time entertainment. Pangborn did every stunt imaginable. He'd leap from cars to planes with ladders hanging down, jump from one plane to another. But Pang's signature stunt was flying upside down. Pangborn became so good at it that he actually wrote the word Pang across the top wing of his airplane. In 1931, Pangborn partnered up with Playboy Hugh Herndon in an attempt to break the world air speed record. Herndon, better known in society circles than aviation circles, was the son of Standard Oil heiress Alice Boardman. His mother agreed to put up the money that was necessary for this round-the-world flight, $100,000. Pangborn knew there was only one plane for the job, the Balanca Skyrocket long-distance model J3 monoplane, the Miss Vidal. Balanca designed very, very stable, strong, heavy lift aircraft. They were the state of the art of the time period. The Miss Vidal took off from Roosevelt Field chasing a new world speed record set by Wiley Post and Harold Gaddy of just over eight days. They encountered fog over the Atlantic, delays in Europe, and were forced to land in a driving rainstorm in Siberia there was no hope of beating the world speed record.
but there was something else. A $25,000 prize offered by Japan's Asahi Shibun newspaper for the first non-stop flight across the Pacific. From Siberia, Pangborn cabled the editor of the English-language Japanese Times, in effect asking for directions, and that the U.S. Embassy obtain landing permission from the Japanese government. Impatient waiting for a response, they flew to Japan. Upon landing, they were promptly arrested as spies. They spent 56 days under house arrest and surveillance. It was a difficult time. The aviators passed by modifying Miss Vidal for a Trans-Pacific crossing. Pangborn and Herndon were finally freed, and they had permission to attempt the Trans-Pacific flight. They immediately flew north to Sabashiro Beach. The beach had been set up as a runway by the people of nearby Misawa, and had been used many times by aviators attempting the Trans-Pacific flight. They had packed the sand of the beach down, and they built a ramp at one end of the beach so that the airplanes could start on their ramp. Pangborn knew the crossing would be risky. He added fuel tanks, skid underbelly, and rigged a way to drop the landing gear. Pangborn understood that to reach America, he would have to jettison the landing gear, that the landing gear weighed hundreds of pounds, and it also created a tremendous amount of drag. The drag added up to uh, 15 miles an hour, and it was a, an over 40 hour flight, so it adds up to about 600 additional miles of range. Ready for takeoff, a very overweight Miss Vidal was rolled to the top of the ramp. They were carrying 915 gallons of gasoline. It was one big flying gas tank. With hundreds watching, Pangborn and Herndon revved the Pratt & Whitney engine and began lumbering down the mile-and-a-half beach runway. It must have been a tremendous feat of luck to even get off the beach at Sabashiro. Pangborn and Herndon came within several hundred yards of hitting these logs at the end of the beach. Out over the Pacific, Pang pulled the cable to drop the landing gear. The wheels released, but two struts didn't making a belly landing, any landing, impossible. So Pangborn, drawing on his skills from his days in the flying circus, actually went out onto the wing and manually released the landing gear struts from the outside. They climbed to over 14,000 feet to pick up the tailwinds, and the barnstormer and playboy braced for the long flight. It was uh, very uncomfortable, I'm sure. Very cold, no heater. Even the tea they took along froze, the water they took froze. They made it through the night. By morning, they were off the coast of Alaska and headed for their final destination, Boise, Idaho. But along the way, fog forced a change in course. This was a cold October morning uh, when we heard that the plane was possibly going to land at Wenatchee. His mother lived here and his brother was a jeweler in town. They kept telling us that Seattle was trying to get him to land in Seattle. And then when I looked around and saw his mother, I knew he would not land in Seattle. We heard the plane and we, we saw it coming in and I'll, I'll never forget my dad uh, yelled at my mother, Bernice, he said, there's no wheels on it. I remember vividly the, the landing. He came in, there were no wheels on the plane, and the propeller was horizontal. Everybody was real quiet. I thought it was sure going to clear on over to it on his back. All of a sudden, why everybody started running, on, running up here. On October 5th, 1931, after 41 hours in the air, Clyde Pangborn and Hugh Herndon were first to cross the Pacific nonstop. Some say the Great Depression wiped out fame for Pangborn, as it wiped out so much else across the country. Those days, you couldn't have done those kind of things without the iron nerve. He was a pilot's pilot. Clyde Pangborn, when he died, had 28,000 hours of flying and had never lost an airplane or harmed a passenger. Clyde Pangborn earned a place in aviation history as did Wenatchee and Misawa, Japan. 
Today, the communities maintain close ties and they're working to revive Pangborn's name from the recesses of history and see it alongside the other giants of early aviation. If you have a story idea for Northwest Profiles, send it to KSPS TV, 3911 South Regal, Spokane, Washington, 99223. Northwest Profiles is a presentation of KSPS Public Television.